this evening. Let's sing on the first stanza together now. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond. Tell me of the king. Sing on the third and then the last. Oh, they tell me of the king. Take your seat. Let's sing at least two verses tonight of Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. We started the service off singing about the wonderful grace of Jesus. And it is. And I thought you might enjoy singing a couple of stanzas of this old song this evening. But we'll sing the first and last stanza. You don't need a book. You know the words. So let's sing. Amen. Thank you. Now, congregation, you can be seated. Choir, remain standing. We're singing for you at this time. We shall rise. Hallelujah. We shall rise. Number 272, choir. Let's sing together.
remain standing. We have a few minutes before the pastor should be here, and I thought you might want to hear a couple of standards tonight of number 10. Number 10, ladies, in the book, The Meeting in the Air. And that's a favorite of ours here at Tabernacle. And it's been a while since we've sung this song, but we'll sing a few verses for you tonight, and then the pastor will be here with the message. Number 10. Brother Hughes to give us a solo in just a moment. I have uh, several announcements I need to make. Request of prayer. We have to pray for West uh, Leboon, uh, who's going to the hospital Thursday for surgery, and for Jimmy Steelwell, who also goes in Wednesday for the surgery. And this has been requested by Timmy King. If you bear that in mind, I pray for these. I'd appreciate it. And then I had two telephone calls. Pray for Grady. And Grace Simpson, they're not members of our church, but he's had a heart attack, and we need to pray for them. And also for another one on that page. And then here's a request for prayer for Terry Ryan, who we offered on coming Wednesday, and to be tonight. I bear these two in mind. Pray about these, not appreciated much if you do that. Now, Brother Hughes has a wonderful cassette, or maybe several cassettes. And if I was you, I'd approach him about using them coming Christmas season. They make a nice gift uh, to a friend or to a loved one who loves gospel music. And the songs that he sings, many of them, are his own compositions. So you check with him and ask about those cassettes, okay? When you're faced with temptation, don't give in. No matter how strong the within, lift a hand to the sky, raise your voice and cry on your knee prayerfully. Don't give in When you're faced with a trial Do not sin For new hope with 
tomorrow begins. Clasp your faith to your heart, look to God and start on your way carefully. Do not sin. Say glory. Hallelujah. Shout glory. Amen. Shout glory. When you're faced with the devil, don't trust him. No matter what he promised, you'll win. With God's word as your sword, in the name of the Lord, take your stand faithfully. Don't trust him. Say glory. Hallelujah. Say glory. Amen. Shout glory. Bible open to the Proverbs. Proverbs, chapter number 22, verse number 28. Proverbs 22, verse number 28 for my text in the hour. Thank you, Brother Hughes, for that song. The thought occurred to me, did you teach those black boys to sing that when you were in Chicago? That would have been good for them to sing, wouldn't it? The black choir that sang for us not too long ago. He was up there last week, a week before last, and and I'm sure they'd love to have that song. That's good. We white people enjoy that, don't we? Amen. That's good. Now, I have a sermon that I want to bring to you tonight that I preached uh, 50 years ago at the church at Pelham. I wrote on the back of the, sh- the, the sermon page, Pelham, 19, uh, February the 2nd, 19, uh, uh, February 24th, 1944. Well, anyway, you figure that, that's 50 years. We're now in 94. What about that? This Bible is an old book. In 1942, the local church here in Greenville ordained your pastor to preach. And I appreciate that ordination. God called me in 52, in uh, 40. The church ordained me in 42. And he gave me this Bible. And it was a loose leaf Bible. And it was a nice Bible, but like all Bibles, they wear out. And down the road, the bind and the outside bound of the leather gave away and just disintegrated. And I have a good brother over in North Carolina that's a shoemaker. He repairs shoes. He's repaired my shoes almost all my life. I go, when I go by his place, I leave him. He does a good job. As I have on now, he repaired not too long ago. But he, he put a new bike on this Bible, a real good leather. I mean, that's cowhide leather. And I'll never, I'll never wear it out. No way you can wear it out. In one lifetime, and I've, I prize this Bible because of its age and because of its durability. It's traveled with me through many dangerous toil and snares. And I preached out of it many times. And I typed this sermon out as a young preacher in 1942, put it in this book. And, uh, it's been all these years, 50 years. Now I want to preach it two or three times in all these 50 years. The first it fell in while I was there, Pastor. And then here at Tabernacle tonight, the Lord will it. 
The text in verse number 28, uh, the wise man of the Bible exhorted, remove not the ancient landmarks which thy fathers are upset. Remove not the ancient landmark which our fathers, your fathers, and my fathers have set up for our profit and for our gain. And we can learn a lot from those that came on before us. I often travel <clears throat> across the Blue Ridge <clears throat> and on 19 and 23, when you get to the top of the mountain, just over at the top of the mountain is Tennessee. The Tennessee line is at the top of uh, number 19 and 23. And, uh, and, uh, uh, you'll find a graveyard just on the left, 50 feet off the highway. No church, just a graveyard. And I, in my mind, I think about those old days. The Greenville County was settled back in the, uh, 1700, about 1750. It was instituted as a county, Greenville County, in 1787. Uh, that's been just 200 years ago. And the people traveling over into Tennessee, not many, not many traveled there because there were no, there were no settlements in Tennessee until later on. At that time, Tennessee was not a state, it was a territory. But some people made trips of their merchants for their merchandise, trading uh, with the Indians for their skins and so forth, and then selling merchandise for what merchants there might have been in the territory of Tennessee, had to travel across the mountain the hard way. No highways, no automobiles. Had to travel horseback or had to travel in a wagon train. We've seen those uh, in the old western movies. Well, it was not the west then, it was the Carolinas. There's that kind of thing that had to be done because there's no other way to get over there. And uh, the landmarks on that kind of a highway, quotation mark, not much of a highway we're not considered in our day, but the landmarks are vitally important. They're important today. Landmarks are important uh, in our superhighways, in our U.S. highways, even nowadays. The highway here uh, to the right of our church is Whitehorse Road, U.S. number 25, a bypass. Now, that's important. Many a trucker who's never been to South Carolina travels this highway every day. Many a merchant, a salesman, a tourist who never been to South Carolina, as you and I have been here all our lives, Travel this highway every day. And they didn't know to travel it because they, it's marked very clearly US 25 bypass. And that, that's, uh, we've got grown accustomed to it. Uh, did you realize that all the US highways and all the, uh, the, uh, interstate highways traveling north and south are travel, are numbered with an uneven number, uneven. US, uh, interstate 85, uneven number travels north and south. And all the interstates uh, traveling east and west are travel uh, are numbered with an even letter. Probably a good word to remember that. You have you, uh, interstate uh, uh, 26 going through Spartanburg down to Charleston. That's east and west. And all east and west interstates are even letters. Same thing you so saw with U.S. highways. The reason 25 is an uneven number because it travels north and south. And if you travel another uh, 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 U.S. Highway uh, East and West, you'll find it to be an even number, you see. I'd be good to remember that. And then they're, they're marked very clearly. Many times when I go up Interstate 40 over to Tennessee, right on top of a mountain, between North Carolina and Tennessee, uh, you get the Tennessee line, uh, you see a sign. It says exit 451. The next exit. That's the first exit in Tennessee. Number 451. When I see that, I know I am 451 miles from the Mississippi River, from the end of Tennessee, in Memphis. The road goes round out down the Mississippi, uh, round through Tennessee to the Mississippi and the great city of Memphis. And there the numbers change. But every mile is numbered that way. Every exit tells you how far it is uh, to Memphis. If you'll follow the exit down close to, uh, to Knoxville, it's uh, exit uh, number 386. That means it's 386 miles to Memphis, Tennessee. It's good to know that when you're traveling. And I learned that uh, the hard way. I watched the highways and learned it. And then if you're coming this way, uh, uh, you don't know to pick up at the top of the mountains of North Carolina. You'll find the number one, number two, number three on down the line. And it's 44 miles on the top of the mountain to Asheville. How do you know that? 
highway signs tell me that. Exactly 44 miles from the top of the mountain in North Carolina until you get to Asheville, 44 miles. And then you can follow the same principle right on down to Greenville, Spartanburg, and uh, Charleston. The same numbers are there. And if you know how to read those numbers, you know where you are at the glance of the eye when you make, make these intersections. intersections. Up in Canton, North Carolina, they made a new clover leaf. I had a little church named Harmony Grove Church where I preached, I guess, six or eight times down through the years. And they made a brand new intersection, and the number of that new intersection is number 33. Well, how'd they come up with that number? It's 33 miles from the North Carolina line where that intersection was made. And they number those intersections by the number of miles from the, uh, from the line where the highway begins to be numbered in a new way. And you watch those things, you can learn a great deal about where you are. Now, can you imagine the bedlam that would occur if somebody changed those landmarks to a stranger? Now, it wouldn't make much difference to me because I know the highway, uh, not only because of the signs and the markers, but because of the, uh, the, uh, the environment, the mountains and the housing and other things that I'm acquainted with between here and, and Tennessee or between here and any other places. But a man that's a total stranger, and you need to be aware of the fact that some people see our church for the first time in their lives every day. There are new people who travel this road every day. They didn't even know the church is here. They may know nothing about it, but they see it for the first time. Now, a stranger, with all the signs mixed up or changed any way you wanted to fix it, uh, you'd, you'd make, make bedlam. They'd never get anywhere. Back in the old days, uh, more necessary than ever, that the landmarks not be destroyed. How would a merchant get from Greenville over to the Indians in Tennessee? If you bother the landmark, they'd never get there, never get to the top of the mountain. Now, I would imagine those great, that graveyard that I mentioned a moment ago was there uh, because of people who died on the journey and they couldn't wait to get town to a proper burial. Traveling was slow, it might take two or three days to get to a place where they'd be taken care of in a proper way. Uh, so they started a cemetery on top of the mountain. And I guess there's several, uh, several scores of tomb rocks in that small cemetery there today. God only knows who they may be. But chances are they were tourists who died making the trip from South Carolina over into Tennessee. Remove not the ancient landmarks which our fathers have set. <laughs> I remember the first time that I saw a milestone out of granite. On a highway over near Elberton, Georgia. I think it's highway number, uh, number 17 from Decoa down to Elberton, Georgia. I'm not sure, but I think that's the highway that has milestones about the size of a small tomb rock. And the only thing on that uh, milestone rock is uh, the fact that it's a milestone and the number of miles to the next city. And that's there for people who may not know and they have plenty of granite advertised around, I'm sure. Around Elberton, so they put them out free gratis for them. Likely, the highways could not afford a thing like that. But the highways do have regular, accurate landmarks. Number of miles, traveling north or south, which direction you're going. The highway give you that information if you watch for it. And it's very essential as we sojourn. And all of that is, uh, is, uh, everyday experiences for me and you. We see those things every day. I don't think the wise man of the Bible was talking about a milestone in the words of my text. Nor do I think that he was talking about some other uh, physical milestone along the way necessarily. But he's talking about spiritual milestones. The Bible does place the analogy between the Christian life and a pilgrimage. Over and over again, we'll call sojourners, travelers we are, looking for a city, that hath foundation who's making builders God. We are indeed travelers and strangers in a world.